So pretend like none of that happened. <laughs> Starting now. Um, hey, so welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Patrick Berry, as you can see there. Um, I'm one of the iOS engineers here at Lyft and wanted to uh, just share some of the stuff we've been doing on a dependency injection here. Um, partially because uh, we did something a little bit non-standard and um, just kind of wanted to share a little bit of what we did and why it's a little different than some of the kind of popular so solutions you've probably seen out there. Um, and also wanted to show how we uh, leverage some of the uh, language features of Swift to, uh, to get some kind of nice properties out of what we did. Um, so we're going to do a quick overview here. Uh, first of all, just to kind of get everyone on the same page, I, I'm sure most of you are familiar with dependency injection, but if some of you are not, uh, we're going to quickly run through the basics just to uh, get everyone uh, up to speed. Um, we'll talk a little bit about what our uh, kind of needs and sort of our opinionations here at Lyft were um, that, that uh, dictated the solution that we ended up with. Uh, kind of run through some of the options that were available and the pros and cons in light of our needs. Um, we'll talk a little bit about indirect instantiation, which is a big part of what we ended up with. Uh, talk more a bit about scope dependencies. Then we'll go into the guided meditation session and uh, finally the ecstatic dance. Um, so this one slide is all you ever need to know about dependency injection. Uh, we could just all go home after this. Um, what is dependency injection? In short, it's just that dependencies are handed in instead of reaching out for them, right? Um, in some ways, it's kind of absurdly simple. Like normally, you're not normally, like you might write code like this where your ride manager is kind of just grabbing some ride API singleton or uh, some static members on a struct or something um, or instantiating its own object and using it. Um, and the only change for dependency injection is instead of reaching out, someone hands it into you and you pass in a write API object and you assign that to a property and then you use that instead. Right? That's the whole thing. Like, so in a way it's absurdly simple. Like, like, and you might wonder like, why do we even bother with this? Like, it seems like such a trivial change. What do we actually get out of this? Um, we get kind of a surprising amount out of this this very small change. Um, one is that your, your code becomes better isolated. You notice that that other code was new about this singleton that was out there, and so it needs that singleton to exist in order for it to function. Where if you handed a dependency, it could, you could get that dependency from anywhere. Um, so it is more isolated from the rest of the world that it lives in, um, which by itself gives you more usability, um, but also you could pass in different versions of that dependency, especially if it's depending on some sort of abstract interface instead of a concrete type, right? Um, then there's this one that everyone, what, what's what everyone usually talks about is the testability, which also relates to these things. Um, and a short test can inject mocks in place of real dependencies, and that lets you isolate um, the type under test uh, so that your tests aren't testing your entire code base because you don't want um, changes to other types to break your tests. You can imagine if you change, make some change in some very common dependency and suddenly all your tests are failing all over the place and that's not super helpful or useful. Um, so, picking an approach. Um, there's different ways of doing this, and to be certain, and, you know, it's worth saying, especially since we're having two, diff two talks on two different ways of doing this, that this isn't really a solved problem, right? Like, for as sort of straightforward as it seems to be, people are still actively kind of figuring out the best ways of doing this. Um, and there's kind of no one-size-fits-all solution either, right? Like, it depends on your needs. Like, it depends on the code base you have, where you're at, are you starting from scratch, are you writing a little thing, are you writing a giant thing, do you have a lot of code, that, a huge code base that you're starting out with, like, um, are you doing OOP? Are you doing something else, right? Like, like it's not one size fits all. Um, so you gotta kind of evaluate your own needs and priorities, preferences, opinionations. That's not a word, by the way, I'm just using it. Uh, so we're hoping that like these two talks are gonna be kind of a study in contrast, right? Like the solution I'm gonna talk about um, is sort of kind of a pretty minimalist solution. Um, uh, I can't speak French very well, but Théophane, I'll maybe say it correctly, Théophane. Um, wrote in more of an entire DI framework um, and because his needs were different. And so hopefully the contrast of those two um, solutions will shed some light on how uh, looking at your needs can lead you to different kinds of uh, solutions. Um, so our situation. First of all, we have, we were dealing, we're dealing with a very large code base, about 300,000, more than 300,000 lines of code, more than 5,000 files. 
Um, it's also a very modular code base. Uh, it's broken up into m about 300 modules at the moment and more every day. Um, and it was mostly written without the I. Um, there are exceptions to this. There are parts of it that were written with uh, initializer injection or whatever, but a large chunk of it um, wasn't written that way. Uh, for example, uh, there are more than 60 or so singletons, managers, and whatnot in the code base. That's, um, there's also pervasive use of like static functions on structs, um, which is basically a singleton. Um, and also something about static functions on structs is you don't then have an initializer to pass things in through. Uh, much of our business logic is actually in protocol extensions that are used kind of like mix-ins, and those don't have initializers either. Um, so that's kind of what we were dealing with, right? We had to have a solution that would work for this. Uh, we have some must-haves, or some requirements. This is kind of how engineers like to think, right? What are our requirements? Um, we need to know these things, right? These are must-haves. Like any solution that didn't give us these things was just not gonna, not gonna, not gonna go. Um, it needs to work for uh, some non-OOP parts of our code base, right? There's lots of stuff that isn't written as OOP. It's you know protocol extensions and static functions and all this kind of stuff. Um, so you can't assume that everything's an object and everything has an initializer and all of that. You need to be able to deal with these things. Um, we need an easy incremental adoption path. Uh, we have 300,000 lines of code. We're not going to rewrite it all, and we're certainly not going to stop shipping in the meantime. So there's got to be a story there to get from here to there. Um, we need a decentralized and modular configuration. As I mentioned, we have 300 modules and more coming. Um, and we absolutely need type safety, compile time safety, thread safety. We don't like to find things out at runtime. Um, so beyond that, that's, those are the must-haves. Then what are the kind of the want-to-haves, right? Well, that's, that's what are kind of our opinions about how we want to do things? Um, and this, there's no right or wrong about this. This is just how we like to do things. Um, we particularly, we have a strong emphasis on keeping things as simple as possible. Um, complexity, you know. Uh, minimal boilerplate is nice, uh, just as a, de a dev XP sort of thing. Um, now, this whole thing about, like, you know, black box type magic, um, that's, uh, people have different opinions on this, like Cogen can do some really cool things for you, but if possible we wanted things to be able to, be, you want, wanted to be able to reason about things in the actual code base um, without having to know that, oh, it's going to do this thing unbeknownst to you. Um, so yeah, we wanted all the behavior and correctness to be visible uh, in the main Swift code base itself. And just to sort of hedge our bets, we wanted to leave the door open to possibly adopting a full DI framework later if we deemed later that it's, a, that it's necessary and appropriate, we didn't want to paint ourselves into a corner. Um, so with all those kind of requirements and needs and preferences in mind, let's look at some of the, I'll run through quickly some of the uh, basic ways of doing dependency injection, partially as an introduction and partially uh, to talk about why we did or did not do some of these things. So initializer injection, this is in some, you already uh, saw this in that uh, other slide. Um, this is in a lot of ways the most kind of straightforward and simple and elemental way of doing dependency injection. You pass it in through the initializer. And that has some nice things. Um, it is simple and straightforward. And uh, because it comes in through the initializer, uh, in Swift in particular, and how strict it is about everything having a value at all times, um, it lets you store it as a private let constant property on the, um, on the instance, uh, which is just nice. You know, immut immutability is your friend. And you want to be able to keep things private when possible. Um, but there's also some downsides to this. Uh, it would have been it would have been very difficult to retrofit our large, often non OOP code base to use this everywhere for all dependencies that anything needs, right? Like you can just imagine. Um, there's kind of a superset problem here, where like parents must have the superset of all of their descendants' dependencies in order to hand them down to them. Um, and this sort of has this sort of combinatorial sort of thing that happens. Um, and it's particularly challenging for like foundational dependencies, dependencies, things like storage, networking, and things that you need everywhere. And now you're passing that everywhere. Um, and if you want to implement, so if someone wants to implement dependency injection somewhere kind of down the, the object graph a little bit, they can't just do it right there. They've got to change all their code upstream to give it storage or whatever. And, and now your little thing turns into a big, big, big PR. Um, so, oh, also, Static functions, protocol extensions, these things don't have initializers, so. Ah, yeah, boilerplate, whatever. <coughs> so, also this property injection. Very similar in a lot of ways, uh, except the instance is already there. Um, 
So it has some of the same problems as initializer injection because it's so similar. It can work for static members because it doesn't require an initializer to work. It doesn't help you with protocol extensions, though. Um, downside, it, that dependency now has to be a public var. Uh, you, need, you need to be public or at least internal so that, like, you can pass it in. And as we have var, because uh, you're going to change it after initialization, it needs to be an optional. It needs to, or maybe an implicitly unwrapped optional, which is fun at runtime. Um, these are all kind of downsides to this approach. Sometimes you have to, but you know, those are downsides to be considered. Argument injection, you just pass it in as an argument to an individual function or method. Um, and again, this has, oh, not again. This has another benefit. This actually works for protocol extensions too. Um, but there's kind of an API blow to this, like how many things you're going to pass in through uh, arguments. It starts to turn into a lot of things. Um, and, oh, yeah, you still have this sort of superset problem. You still have to have a dependency held by the parent to pass down to methods on the children. Um, this is another approach that's different in a lot of ways from those. Um, and I'm sure maybe all who are kind of curious about DI have seen some solutions like this on the, on, on the, the internets. Um, of a kind of like an environment, it's sort of like your 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 one singleton to rule them all, right? Like you have some sort of like an environment or a context that gives you um, a set of like the main dependencies you need, uh, API, storage, whatever, uh, networking, um, and then your client types can sort of just access it by way of the of the environment. Um, but since there's this one environment, you can swap the whole thing out for tests, right? So like that gives you a way of uh, replacing the implementation for tests and such. And such. Um, the clients don't need to know where those instances come from. So that avoids the superset problem, right? Here we're not like passing anything in. Like you can just sort of access the environment as if it were a singleton, because it is. Um, you do kind of get around the boiler the boilerplate problem. Uh, but there are some downsides to this that it doesn't really scale, right? Like, it's nice when, you know, you're building a little app and you just want to, like, mock out, like, the all your I.O., right? Like, your date and your storage and your network and a couple things like this. But, um, you know, that's fine for that. But we have, like, 5,000 types we want to test. Um, plus or minus. And we want to isolate most of those from their dependencies, and that's a really big environment then. Um, so it doesn't work so well for that. And you actually end up with this sort of like hard limitation in that like an environment that knows about all of these types is a thing that you can't, those types can't in turn depend on because you get a circular, circular import cycles in your module structure and they won't compile anymore. Um, so the, the other sort of common option that people go for is a, is a DI framework. There's all kinds of third party DI frameworks and there's lots of benefits to, to going this route. Um, it just works, you know, like it's, it's someone has spent the time and developed it and thought all through, all through all the edge cases and did the work so you don't have to. Um, it's kind of a complete solution, full featured, um, handles things like circular dependency resolution, which can be a little tricky, uh, handles like scoping, like if you have local scope or graph scope or singletons or whatever, like uh, there's, it provides for that. Um, hopefully it's thread safe, usually it is. Um, some of them are have give you compile time safety, although some of them don't, um, and so on, right? Like, they've thought through these things. Uh, yeah, you get the idea. Um, so we evaluated some, several of the popular ones, but uh, decided against it for now for a few reasons. Um, one, uh, the, adopting a DI framework involves bringing in some complexity, right? Um, all these solutions, all the popular solutions are uh, thousands of lines of code, somewhere between five and 12,000 lines of code, 50 to 100 plus files. Um, and I'm not saying this is a, 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 a bad thing, but it's just a consideration, right? You've got to consider this. If you're going to like bring this into your code base and depend on it, you just don't be naive about that. You're, you're, you're depending on a lot of complexity now. You can, you, even if it's open source, you might have to take it on, take on maintaining it yourself someday, if, and you've got to be ready for that. Um, there's a learning curve to these things. They introduce a lot of abstractions and types and stuff that you need to, and behaviors that you d people need to understand to understand how their code base is going to work. Um, and part of that is also makes it a little bit harder to reason about your production code. Um, sometimes, depending on how it's implemented, because, you know, the way objects are shared and there's some code gen that kind of does some stuff for you, and, like, just looking at production code doesn't tell the whole story anymore. Um, and you're sort of, like, buying into their design decisions, and some of them you may like and some of them you may not like, um, but you're buying them all. 
For example, in uh, Swinject, this is the main function for getting an instance, and it returns an optional, because it's not actually compile time safe, so it, does, so it doesn't know until runtime whether it can give you an instance of the thing that you're asking for. Um, maybe not a big deal, depending on what you're doing, but uh, we didn't want to like deal with this, because you can't really, like, uh, I mean, for our code base, we didn't feel like we could like intelligently handle this. Uh, either you're going to force unwrap and then find out at runtime if you're going to crash, or what do you do if, if, if the instance isn't there? Um, oft also, BI frameworks kind of want to own the world, so like sometimes incremental adoption uh, can often be difficult and or impossible. Um, yeah. And it's something to, to, to think about a lot, because this becomes your sort of one dependency to rule them all, right? Like it becomes so interwoven with your code everywhere and the particular like conventions that it has and the types that it has in a way that like you probably extra extricating yourself from it later would be, at, be a lot of work at best, right? So just it's worth being careful about. So what to do? What should we do here? Um, we have our needs and all this. If we step back for a second, Let's think about what we're trying to solve here. Like, what is the central problem that DI solves for you, right? What is it actually doing for you? Um, I think if you boil it down and read a lot, <laughs> you kind of come across this, that more or less what makes code untestable is mixing business logic with instant creation. Uh, and I attribute this quote to everybody because pretty much that is, like, anyone who's looked at DI long, DI long enough, that's sort of, like, the, the problem. Um, that, like, you're trying to test some business logic that creates, that, that, that lives in some type, um, and you can't isolate it because that type is also creating instances and you don't have any control over that in your tests. Um, so once you kind of think about it that way, that once you start treating instance creation as a responsibility, well, we have this thing called the single responsibility principle, and then it kind of falls out rather naturally that you need to factor that out. So let's factor that respons that out that responsibility to the DI system, and we're not going to have our business logic do this anymore. Um, so, based on all this, we can pretty much surmise what our DI system should look like. And it looks more or less like this, right? <laughs> this is sort of the signature, signature of it. Like, an, an instance appears, right? Like, it just gives you instances of things. Um, at a most elemental level, this is kind of what your DI system is doing for you. Um, but you need to tell, this is not enough, right? Obviously, because it doesn't know how to create any instance of any random thing. So you need to be able to tell the DI system how to make things. So you, now what you really need is this where you say, I'll tell you how to make things, here's a closure to give you an instance of a thing, and then you give me a closure to give me an instance of a thing. Um, and that may seem a little silly, but like, what this actually does, if you just handed back the same closure as, uh, if it just handed back the same closure that it gave you, then well, you're back where you were, but that error in the middle is important, because that gives you a level of indirection. In the middle there, things can happen, right? Um, you don't get back the same closure that you, that you passed in. So, that's kind of what we want. This isn't quite it either, though, because like we can't actually let the compiler infer the types here, because we want our closure that we pass in to create a concrete type, right? But the closure we get back, we actually want to give us uh, uh, an abstract interface, right? A protocol or something. So we can't just let the compiler infer those two Ts are actually different. So now we need something like this. We need to tell the compiler what type we expect to get back, and that's our abstract interface. Um, and we give it a way to make that abstract interface, using our concrete type, and then it gives us a way to make our instances. Sweet. So we're binding an abstract interface to a way to make it. And then the, the, the DI system gives us back what we need. So this then kind of gives us the basic signature of what we need from DI. Um, so that leads us to our solution, which is, I mean, like I mentioned, a level in direction. So I don't know, I call it indirect instantiation, probably because it just rolls off the tongue so easily. Um, also known as the world simplest DI framework. Uh, so, what does this look like in practice? I hope everyone can read that. Um, because we're going to spend a little time on this slide. There's a lot to unpack here. Um, this is an example, sort of declaration of, of, of a dependency. Um, Y'all can see that, right? Yeah. Um, so, in our ride manager class or whatever, we get our dependency like this. And there's a few things to note about this. First of all, you'll notice right away, there's a nice clean syntax. There's no boilerplate. You don't have to like uh, assign things inside of initializer and all that jazz. Just this one line. So it's kind of a nice, good, uh, kind of a good developer experience there. And you get the advantages of initializer injection here. You see it's a private let constant. It's assigned right there. Um, 
and you avoid the problems of initializer injection with the superset problem here, right? Like these types can just sort of like get most of the dependencies directly like this. Um, you don't have to pass it in through the initializer. You don't need the parent to give it to you anymore. Um, uh, so minor things, kind of this naming convention with like this sort of get foo sort of uh, naming convention. We just sort of, that was sort of an unclaimed convention in iOS since we don't name our getters that way. So claimed it now. Um, and yeah, also from a devel uh, developer experience uh, point of view, um, there's a nice sort of navigation, code navigation, uh, discoverability thing here. Because like, if you look at this and you're like, what the hell is that? You can uh, command click on that get right, I that get right IPA, <laughs> IPA, <laughs> API interface, and uh, it'll, it'll jump into this line, right? Um, and this is the declaration of the, the whole binding here, right? Um, and you can you can keep navigating from here. Like if you often click on that get ride API inter interface, it tells you what your closure signature is. Um, you can kind of jump through that ride API interface dot self to see what the abstract interface, the protocol is. You can click on the ride API to see what the concrete type is. Um, and you don't. I don't show it in this slide, but our our real version of this also has a way to declare what the default. Uh, the default mock should be, and you can jump to that too. So just from this one spot, it's sort of your grand central station. You can jump to all the relevant things. You can also command click on bind if you want to know how that works. Um, so let's do that. So you command click on bind. There's a top level function that calls through, calls through to this function. Um, and this is basically the exact same well, this is the exact same signature as what I showed you before. There's a little more like, you know, syntax stuff in there, but you look at it, it's the same thing, right? Um, and how does this work? It's really actually quite simple. Um, when you call bind, this closure that you pass to it, basically this instantiator closer, closure gets stored in this instantiator's dictionary, which is a dictionary uh, of uh, where the keys are type representations, um, which is uh, just a, a type that we have as a wrapper around the Swift standard library object identifier, right? Like it's just like an object identifier thing. We just make it so it only works for types and not for instances. But it's the same idea. Um, so the keys are those, and the values are these type instantiators, which is a fancy type alias for any. Because this has to be heterogeneous. These closures that you're storing in here are going to be different every time, right? The, sign the, the type signature of them is different every time. So it's heterogeneous. You have to store it as an any. And that's kind of an interesting problem by itself in Swift. You often run into these problems where it's nice to have a strong type system, but occasionally you're like, damn it, just let me put anything in there. How do you do that in a safe way? This is actually totally type safe, and I'll explain why. Um, right, so you put it in the dictionary, uh, but you're going to say, oh, you said that you're going to want thread safety, but that is sure not thread safe, right? Th I'm making it simpler for the slides. The real implementation has like an atomic wrapper around it and, and locks and blah, 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 but I just didn't want to pollute the slides with that. So just know going forward, all the slides with these dictionaries is all thread safe, but I just didn't want to confuse things. So anyway, th so you store the closure in the dictionary, and then you return this, self.instance. So that looks like a property. It's not. It's actually a function. It's a generic function, in fact. Um, so what you're returning to is a reference to the specialization of this generic function, right? Um, which, that's important because it's a specialization, so it captures the type information that's present at that point, the T in that generic function. So bear that in mind. It makes it safe. Um, this is the instant function. Uh, Notice that it's private, first of all. So it's a private function, so you can't access this except as the closure that the DI system gives you back as, in, as the return type from the bind function. So um, there's no way to try to get an instance before you have given it a closure to create instances with. So it's totally safe in that way. Um, also, let's see. So what do you do? In the, in the instance function, you just get the closure back out of the dictionary. You force cast it which looks dangerous and kind of scary, the exclamation point, except that that is totally safe because, as I mentioned before, the type of information actually carries over. So even though it was stored as an any and you have to force cast it, A, you know that dictionaries return optionals, right? Except that you know that it's going to be in there because you can only get here if you just called bind. You had to have just put a thing in a dictionary to even get here. And you know it's going to be that type because actually the type information is preserved. It's just you had to type erase it to put it in the dictionary. So that is actually totally safe. And then you execute the instantiator to get your instance, right? So it's, uh, it's pretty straightforward. Now, I kind of skipped over this before. This is why we do all this, right? 
if if you just did this and you didn't have that, you would have just gone a, gone a long way around executing your own closure, and why didn't you just execute it yourself? It's because we have this indirection now, which means that we can intervene. And this is where we intervene. If we are in a test environment, we want to do something different. So this is the expand of it. This is that same code. If we're in a test environment, um, we're going to look and see if we have a way to create mocks instead. Same idea, the same dictionary that uh, has, holds the instantiation closures. And if it is there, we will return the result of executing that closure. Um, if it's not there, we're going to assert. Because we don't want to accidentally run the production versions of our dependencies in our tests. Um, and this actually enforces that. If you accidentally kind of like don't mock something, and you're <laughs> testing an entire graph of objects, this is going to let you know not very politely. Um, so. How do we provide the mock instantiator? Is probably exactly what you imagine. There's a mock function that's very similar, and there's a top-level function that goes along with this. Um, another dictionary of the same sort, and we put it in there, right? It's exactly what you'd think. Um, so how do we use this in tests? Here's an example, just sort of a made-up example in a test, right? Like, so you're testing some type, you're testing your ride manager type, um, and so. In your setup for your test, you just call this mock function, and you say, for this abstract interface, instead of the production thing, I want I want this this mock to be returned. When you create your ride manager, then uh, it gets the mocks for those dependencies, and you can test it. Um, and there's this unmock function I didn't show you the implementation for, but it just clears all that shit out, right? So the basic idea. So advantages of the solution. Uh, the advantages in general. It's obviously very simple. Anybody like you could probably go home and write this right now. Um, it's 300 lines of code in three files, and half of those lines of code are comments. Um, it has a single responsibility. All it's doing is providing instances. Uh, and yet it gives you type safety, compile time safety, thread safety. Um, it has a sort of minimal, minimal boilerplate, kind of a nice dev developer experience thing, very low learning curve. Um, and there's nothing magic going on. You can look at all this and understand the entire correctness of it all in probably 15 minutes. Um, and in our particular case, there's this easy adoption pathway for our large, large code base, right? It's not asking to rule the world. Like, you can do this on a one-by-one -one basis. Um, it is scalable in that, like, this configuration is decentralized. Oh, I totally skipped some things, some things before. Damn. Um, I missed a few things before. Uh, let me mention, uh, hmm, I'm going to go back. Let me say two more things about this. Um, so one is that this is obviously decentralized, right? This one line is all it takes to, um, to configure a type to be used with the DI system. Um, and you can put this in the individual modules that declare the types, right? So you can have this, this, this configuration of DI sort of spread out among the modules. Um, it's also worth mentioning that if you notice, this is a top-level property. And in Swift, another nice language feature and way of leveraging it, in Swift, top-level properties um, are, are always implicitly lazy, right? They're not evaluated until the first time you try to access them. So this bind call doesn't happen until the first time you try to access a given type. The first time you try to get access that closure, it triggers the bind as a side effect, but does the binding, and you get the closure, and you execute it, and all this sort of jazz. What's so nice about that is you could have five types or 5,000, and your start time, your launch time is going to be the same because depending, it, like you're not going to, you're not loading this enormous XML file and this huge configuration for all of your entire object graphs for everything. Um, you don't do, you don't pay any of the cost of this until the first time you access things. Um, it's just sort of subtly in there with the fact that it's a top level property, um, but it makes it more scalable in that way. Did I miss anything else in here? Oh, it also makes it safe that the bind call is executed as a side effect of accessing it. You get the idea. Okay. Let's go back where we were. Cool. So we have tests. We unmocked. Yeah. All this. Yeah. So decentralized configuration and pretty much no startup, in startup, no startup time impact per se and doesn't increase as the code base gets larger. It works. It can work for non-OOP code because you don't need to have initializers. Um, it enforced mocking dependencies and tests, which is kind of a nice thing. Uh, it can, you, can, you can provide de default mocks. I didn't show that, but it's pretty straightforward. And in the end, you have this sort of like self-dot dependency, this sort of property access to dependencies, right? 
which is how most DI frameworks are going to give you dependencies. You're going to, uh, if you were to adopt a DI framework later, that's how you get your dependencies. Um, so doing it this way means that we could easily adopt that later if we decided to. Um, yeah, so where does that leave us? You know, at least it's this place where we can like incrementally start replacing all these, this, these singleton access with injected abstract interfaces. And that's a pretty nice change to make in any code base, right? Like that by itself can go a long way towards making a lot of code bases a lot more testable. I mean, a lot of, you know, startups in particular, like you're working on something and you just, you write a bunch of singletons to make things work. Later you want to write a bunch of tests and it's like, uh, singletons are the devil, right? Um, this gives you a way to leverage your way out of that um, with very little cost and, and very little buy-in to anything. So we've gone a long way towards doing this already, um, and it can happen very incrementally. You can do it on a per-module basis or whatever. Um, in the process, we've kind of broken up off to a lot of these singleton in interfaces into a collection of smaller abstract interfaces by responsibility, which is kind of a nice thing, and you can later break up your concrete types if you want to. Um, makes things much more testable, as you can obviously see, and it creates this sort of seam, right? Like now, um, instead of depending directly on the singleton, you're, de de you're depending on this abstract interface, um, and you can later replace the implementation without the client code needing to know or care, right? It's just getting an abstract interface and it uses it, and the fact that it's a singleton is sort of neither here nor there. Um, so once you kind of have that seam and you have that ability to change your implementation of things and without disrupting the whole world, uh, what do you do next? The next step is to move away from singletons and, and replace it with kind of a better architecture around state ownership and proper lifetimes and all this jazz. But once you start talk, talk, talking about proper lifetimes, you run into the limitation of this. As you might have noticed, you either, this whole system can either give you a new local instance or a shared global singleton, and there's nothing in between. Which raises the question, what about shared instances with some kind of intermediate scope, right? And intermediate can mean like by lifetime, that it's not a singleton that lives forever. It's maybe like something that has a lifetime and goes away at some point. It's intermediate maybe in the sense that like it's not, you don't want the same instance to be available to every place in your application. There are certain object graphs that want this instance and other object graphs that want that instance and you kind of want to be able to distinguish those things. Um, so how do you handle this? So third-party DI frameworks all have a way to handle this for you and that's part of why they, they're reason to exist. I won't say it in French. Um, but that's also where a lot of the complexity of these frameworks come from, right? Like if they were just handling singletons and local instances, it'd be a lot simpler, but they're trying to solve that scoping problem for you as well. Um, so before we dive into how to solve this, let's step back and just ask like, why? Like, why do we need this? Let's make sure we need this before we go to great lengths. Um, when does it matter that we have a specific instance? Right? Like, when is it not interchangeable? Like, why do we care we have this one and not that one over there? Um, and the long and short of it is that, like, more often than not, it's because of state, right? That object has some state, and I need that one because it has that state. It has some, doesn't have some other state. That object over there is not the same. Even though the implementation is the same, it's different at runtime because its state is different, and I want that one. So that's kind of clarifying. It kind of comes down to state in a way, uh, at least more often than not. So that state means that like uh, that instance owns the state and it provides some sort of access to it, either directly or indirectly through callbacks, right? Like, like you can have, do a callback on that object to modify the state. And the state could be like model state. It could be UI state, right? That's state too. It could be some sort of configuration that makes it different from another object, but it makes it a unique and special snowflake. Um, just to say, there are other some rare there are the rare cases where you care what object you have or you want to pass it around. Like maybe it's very expensive to create or something. There are exceptions, but nine times out of ten we're talking about state here. So let's talk about state. Uh, the fact that DI feels like it has to solve this all the time everywhere is kind of <laughs> kind of be be belies its uh, OOP heritage and that like OOP kind of originally assumed that objects usually are always encapsulate state, right? That was sort of the original idea. That's how it was the big. The big idea was compared to imperative programming was objects encapsulate their state. Um, and, o and DI kind of grew up around, you know, the 90s and 2000s in the OOP world. Um, so before going on, we want to, you know, be opinionated again about what we actually want in our code base. And so we actually kind of strive for statelessness as much as possible. You know, we've come a long way since the 90s. Um, and 
at least as much as possible. We try to make our code as reactive as possible, um, meaning that you react to value streams without owning them. And owning is an important distinction there. Uh, trying things as kind of as some, you know when possible, we make things you know pure functions. Um, and these things together kind of mean that like types are responding to state or transforming it, but they don't own it. So at least a lot of the time, uh, needing a specific object instance should be more the exception than the rule. Um, and that's just sort of a preference that we have. So fortunately, well, what would I, before we get there, uh, so based on that, let's think about now what our requirements are for this sort of scoped version of all this, right? So we can assume, like we just talked about, and we can optimize for a shorter list of state-owning dependencies, right? We're not trying to pass the whole world everywhere. Um, we just want a few things. Um, but we absolutely need compile time safety as before. And this is trickier in this case because uh, we need to guarantee, guarantee that the dependency that has some sort of intermediate lifetime is alive at the time when you call it, right? Or else, boom. Uh, and you need some way to indicate which instance to share in a given object graph, right? Like this one belongs over here, that one belongs over there. You have gotta keep that straight somehow, some kind of accounting of that. Um, and you also want some way of kind of controlling the lifetime and the, uh, the scopes of these shared, of these shared instances. instances. Um, fortunately, there's a good solution for that. Uh, it's called initializer injection. Um, so it's the most straightforward thing. To share an instance in an object graph, you just hand it to its descendants. Um, the, and you get a lot out of that you don't usually think about. Like it specifies which instance, it handles the lifetime because the parent owns the object and the, owns the children too and all the lifetimes in the line. Um, it's obviously compile time safe, at least in the languages like Swift where you can't put, p pass null around like a animal. Um, and it's manageable in this case, unlike when we were considering it to handle all of our dependencies, because like we had this preference about the things that should be handled this way. It's not everything. It's just this short list of things that are owning state. Um, so we're limiting it to these specific use cases. So our kind of init argument counts should remain smallish. Um, and we'll continue to use this sort of like get foo dependency for other dependencies, everything else. Um, even things that access state, or you might think as stateful objects, if they're not the things that are owning the state, then you can still get your own instance of it. You got the state from your parent, because that's the thing that came in your initializer, and you can pass it to, I didn't mention this either, you can pass it to uh, your own instance of this thing, in, uh, it, even through this DI, DI thing. And the thing I just forgot to mention before is that there's versions of all those bind calls and all that that have arguments, instead of just being like a empty, uh, empty initializer. Um, so, yeah, the advantage of this, the object sharing is clear and is explicit in the production code. It's not like some behind the scenes, you know, behind the curtain uh, thing that, that the DI system is doing for you. Um, nothing to learn, everyone knows how to do this. Uh, obviously it's compile time safe. Um, it also kind of handles some of the most common reasons for circular dependencies, like delegation and callbacks and such, since that would be one of the cases that you would use initializer injection for. You don't need the DI system to handle this sort of circular stuff here. Um, and it sort of, we're by, by stating this as a preference, we're kind of encouraging this more stateless and reactive way of doing things. Um, so, wrapping up. Yeah, I'm pretty good on time. Uh, this is sort of the, the story we end up with, right? This is the four eyes here. We get indirect instantiation combined with initializer injection for a select list of, of types of things. And uh, we kind of get what seems to be a pretty whole solution in, you know, 300 lines of code. Um, and we get a lot out of this. Like, so what we end up with is like, it's type safe, compile time safe, thread safe, decentralized, scalable, low, low boilerplate, low learning curve, easily adopted, highly opinionated EI that remains absurdly simple. So, thank you. have Pat keep his mic and we can take three questions before we move on to the other talk. Uh, now's the time to raise your hand if you want to ask a question I'll bring the mic to you or if you want a quick bite, quick drink or a quick rest break while people ask questions you can do that as well. So any questions? I'm just curious if you looked at all at the idea of injecting the dependencies with a generic type the T in the in a function or in a, in a class. 
uh, injecting them with a generic type. You mean like to provide its dependencies or? Yeah, basically taking the instance of some kind of an API and saying I'm genericizing this function or this class based on the type of that a that dependency. Because generics are kind of dependency injection, right? Oh, um, hmm. I'm not sure I'm quite picturing what you're thinking of, but like if you genericize, so your, your dependency is a generic, and you're saying you're, you're specializing it on the thing that depends on it? Yeah. Um, I'm still, I'm I'm still wondering how you get the generics the mechanism generally is really what I meant. Yeah, I, that sounds super interesting. I would love to see a way of doing that. That sounds cool. No, I did not look at that, and I think it sounds really cool. Um, I would love to see something like that. Yeah, keep in mind, Pat isn't running away after the talk, so you can follow up with him if you'd like. Hi, uh, my name is Dane from Venmo. Uh, I really enjoyed this. Thanks. Um, something I may have fundamentally missed was uh, you were checking whether it was a uh, testing environment or special environment. Uh, how do you inject, I guess, various use cases in that? Um, maybe I just misunderstood it. Various use cases. So you mean like outside of tests? You mean like having different... So if I had like a test functionality one and it behaves this way for that and I would just wanted to validate that and maybe a test functionality two, kind of just variations in implementation. Um, um, so you want to change the implementation of the dependency or of the type under test? Of, of the dependency. Yeah, so you can have different kinds of mocks. So each test can like... Um, when that mock line that said mock, you know, your abstract interface with this dependency, with this mock, you could have any number of different kinds of mocks that all conform to that abstract, to that protocol. So yeah, you could have different versions of your mock. Um, I don't know, I mean, ideally, I don't know if you would want that to impinge the results of your, you know, impinge on the results of your test. Like, a, probably your type should behave correctly as long as your mock is conforming to the contract. But yeah, it, it's flexible to that. That's part of what that unmock line was also, I sh that I showed in the teardown, which I might have breezed by in my haste, um, is it clears out the mocks you declared in the previous test. So each test has a fresh set of mocks, and you can re-mock everything each time. Hope that answers your question. I may follow up in a bit. Okay. We can do one more question before uh, seeing TFN's talk. Here we go. Um, hi. So when you migrated the Lyft code base to the system, how long did it take? And how much manually written bind code did you end up with? And how, how much what? Like, I mean, all the binding code is kind of being written manually, especially when you have like scoped stuff then, and you have different, like if you have uh, things that depend on other things, so your, your blocks will have other getters and, and like with scoping that can get complicated. So how much manual written, like how much code that did that end up with and how hard has it been to maintain that? Um, when you ask how long it took to do it, I'll let you know when we're done. Um, we're some we're a good ways through it, but uh, if not all the way through. Um, as far as like the amount of code in those bind calls, um, they're mostly still just one line a piece. Uh, like you mentioned, like the, the the block might need to have some sort of like other getter in it and all that for it to take the 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 nested dependencies. You don't actually have to do that because like. Um, the type that you create, if it needs its own dependencies, it just declares them as properties. You know what I mean? You don't have to hand it in. Because you're not doing constructor injection in most places. You're just getting everything directly. Right, right, right. Um, and if it is something that where you do pass a thing in through the initializer, then, I did, again, I didn't uh, show it in the slides, but like there are versions of the bind call that, that take an argument and, you know, the arity, whatever, how many, however many arguments we can do if we need it, um, to pass the, the uh, the dependencies in at the time that you call that get foo closure, right? So you're not doing it in the bind call necessarily. The bind call just sort of like uh, gives you a closure that takes as many things as it needs to initialize it. Um, so th that that bind call ends up being basically one line. I mean, unless you've got really long type names and then it wraps, you know. But like, um, yeah, it's the setup is especially once you've done a couple of them, it becomes like you know five seconds of your day to write it. Thank you, everybody.